And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. A man who, a man who, unlike some, does not need to balance both brave and faith. And a man who wants to let us all cling together. The head developer of the of Silence is a Lie. The one and only Kai Niklas. How are you doing today, man? Welcome now. Thank Niklas. you. Yeah. Hello and thanks for, for having me on the show. And uh, it, was, it was kind of uh, interesting to hear you pronounce my name, but it was perfectly fine. I guess it's a bit tricky to pronounce these I'll... foreign names. Look. I'll have uh, I will always have an easier time with German names than I will with Polish names. <laughs> okay, I, I understand. Yes, yes. Besides, as some, as as some as uh, besides, I'd, it would be a bit it would be a, it would be a bit awkward it would be a bit awkward of me if if I couldn't do it given given the amount of um, playtime I've had with the dark eye. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, but hang up. Hold on a moment. Um. Uh, so I'd I'd like to open as I usually do with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So how how did you how did you how did you first get the bug the proverbial bug, as it were, to do game development? Um, that that was quite early, um, starting with a what was it a, the the C sixty four home computer. I, I you may remember this one, the very mm -hmm. first one that you could uh, have at home, playing stuff like oh no, I need to really remind myself, um, Gina Sisters, something like this. Of course, playing Monkey Island, uh, stuff like this. Uh, these were the first, um, the first. Uh, times where I encountered the the entire gaming stuff like this mm -hmm. and pretty quick um, when playing on the PlayStation 1 games like the the old XCOM game this enemy unknown or terror from the deep mm -hmm. or playing Final Fantasy Tactics Final Fantasy 7 this stuff uh, at some point I, I don't know can't can't name the proper date but at some point I somehow asked myself how is this working how, how to do this and uh, that was really this 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 turning point where um i just got curious about how this can be done and it still took some some time from then on uh since by by accident in the basement of a friend we were just sitting around and i don't know why there was a book about php programming language mm -hmm. and um because i just had nothing better to do at this moment i just took it and flipped the pages and uh it hit me at this point, and uh, I really got into programming, and pretty soon realized, okay, now that I know how to to program, I want to um, do game stuff, and this is where I spend a lot of time investing in researching how this can be done, doing coding in C, C++, doing coding in DirectX and OpenGL for the graphic stuff and all this, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, I learned quite a lot on a hobby basis, but um, somehow this also became my business. I'm sorry, programming also became my business. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon this, this business consumed, uh, consumed all of my time. So where there was no time left for the, for the game development. And uh, I found myself um, running a company, doing programming only for my clients, which was not game programming, but mostly websites or app development and other individual programming stuff. And um, for, for a very long time, I was only running my business, um, gaining a lot of experience that way. That was great, uh, but didn't found the time to do game dev only on, on weekends, on Friday nights. Uh, but uh, that's by far not enough because game dev takes a hell of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's, um, that's where it started. It's really just starting as a gamer, I guess many people do. And at some point, I, I can really remember this one. It was just, how is this working? This question just popped up in my mind. And from this moment on, I wanted to know how it's working. And the second that I got in touch with programming, um, 
I knew that's that's something for me, and uh, that definitely changed the course of my life because it was my business. It's my entire business life for over twenty years now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I guess I guess it's really started with with gaming. So I guess my parents didn't didn't knew where they were pointing me towards when they bought the first PC or the first PlayStation. But uh, I guess um, it's that put me on the path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, since you brought since you brought up um, since you brought up XCOM, I'm I. Don't think it would be out of line for me to say that you are very familiar with the with the gag of um, XCOM RNG. <laughs> okay. You know, ninety eight percent chance to hit, still miss. Yeah. But you had but you had specifically cited um, Final Fantasy Tactics and Ogre Battle on the on the Kickstarter pitch for Silent for Silence is a Lie. Um. Could you do you do you suppose you could tell me what what it was that drew you to the, to that particular style of that particular style of play? Basically, the kind of thing that Matsuno was pioneering. Uh, you mean why I chose uh, this type of game to to program now on my own, or um, why basically um, they they attract me? Because uh, these are two different two different things. Um, First of all, to do such a game, I, I played these games massively. I, I can't tell you how many hundreds of hours I spent playing XCOM and I spent playing Final Fantasy Tactics. Um, and I was always this kind of guy when I play XCOM and I had a, a, a very long mission on a, on a huge map. I don't wanted to lose a single guy. So whenever one of my guys died, I restarted over. And this, of course, took days and nights, days and nights. And um, that, that took a lot, a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely uh, fell in love with this kind of gameplay. Same with with Final Fantasy Tactics. Whenever I lost someone, um, I just restarted the um, the battle and tried to make it better this time. Mm -hmm. um, but the decision to to make a game like this, uh, maybe um, on a subconscious level, it was because I spent so much time playing it. But on a conscious level, uh, two years ago, I, I decided, okay, um, now I will make the time to really create a game. And um, this is, of course, some kind of financial and business decision because I need to turn down some of my clients and make sure, okay, I have the time to really make a game. Um, and then it's really a question of looking at the budgets and looking at your own skills because what, what can you do? Um, and I decided that this type of game is something that I want to do and which is reasonable um, in the given schedule and with the given budget because some other games may take way more time and way more budget um, to do. So it was partially um, a, a passion decision because I, I love this type of game. And on the other hand, quite reasonable uh, decision to say, what can I do with the given time and the given budget? And the, this type of game was something that I thought back then would be uh, would be perfect for this. Um, I realized at some point it was a misconception, but uh, basically I'm, I'm on the right path. Uh, actually, I'm behind my schedule because by the beginning of this year, even in February, was my plan to already release the first version. Um, sadly, I'm not there. It will take me at least another six months, I guess. But um, this is uh, this is the, the process. I guess it's on the one hand because I played these games more than anything else, and um, I just planned out what can I do within two years with a given budget. Uh, what kind of game can I really make? Mm -hmm. Now, with with that kind, with that kind of thing in mind, I would like I I would like to ask a bit on the on the des the design setup of. The, of this particular project, because there were a few familiar, there were a few familiar things that I did that I did notice as somebody who's cut his cut his own cut his own teeth on on those particular games. One of them is, of course, go, going with a job class um, system. And in back back in tactics and to a and to a degree ogre battle as well, there was a bit of a tree set up where. Exper where experience and jobs would it would unlock more advanced jobs. Are you going with a similar format? 
Uh, yes, definitely. So to to learn the um, the better or the special job classes, you first of all need to to gain some experience in the lower job classes in some of them. So you are able to to unlock uh, the next job classes to to turn to. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. In that same vein, are you, are you are you operating on a system where you where um there's where there's a certain number of command and support slots tied to each job? You have this um, how how do I call them uh, the ability slots that you can you can learn a lot of abilities uh, depending on the job class and um, when it goes into the next battle you you need to decide okay which of these abilities that I've already learned with this character do I really want to um, equip for the next battle and then you really need to make decisions um, you have two priority uh, primary slots where you can set up something like white magic black, black magic mm -hmm. and you have some other slots like reaction slot so what should happen when you have been attacked um, then some kind of, of movement ability where you can put in stuff like float or speed up something like this so you can learn a lot of abilities based on your job classes mm -hmm. and once you've got these abilities learned you keep them so you may as, as a black mage you may learn black magic and may learn mighty spells and later, if you change your job class to a, a knight, let's say, you still have this ability. Of course, a knight is not such a great mage as a black mage job, mm -hmm. but uh, you still have this ability because you learned it once and you still can equip it. But then again, of course, we have some, some, um, some effects. If you want to use magic, you do not, you're not allowed to wear metal armor, for example. And of course, these things then will always keep you in this, um, in this, decision-making mode where you need to um, need to decide, okay, what do I want to bring to the next battle? Yes, I want to have a knight and he should have a shiny armor, but he should also be uh, able to use magic. Okay, then maybe use the leather armor instead, something like this. So mm -hmm. it's always, there's always a payoff. And that's, mm -hmm. um, that's what I like about these games. You have a lot of options, but you really need to decide, okay, what is my preferred setting for the next battle? And I guess that especially this is something which was so great in Final Fantasy Tactics. You could learn a lot of stuff and have all these abilities, but when it comes to the battle, you can't bring them all to the table. You, you need to decide. And uh, this is really what I consider the, the, what this word Final Fantasy Tactics, the tactic word is for. Mm -hmm. You really need to make decisions and to plan out, okay, if I equip my knight like this and I take along the, the white mage and the black mage, how do I need to set them up properly so I have everything on the battlefield that I need and not only put their five knights, which are all in heavy armor, and then you have got two mages, mages against you and you're lost because um, the knights can't handle them. Mm -hmm. So this is what I, I really like about this one. Yeah. Now, when I, saw, when, I looked at the when I looked at the example classes, I did see the three bars um, set, set up that they have, and just just from just from pre just from experience in previous um rpgs um i can um yeah i'm guessing that's that's the rate that they have with hp mp and, and the third one i was get i was guessing that it was stamina but i could be completely wrong on that front yeah it caught the third one endurance on our side mm -hmm. and this is something where i really um where I really mix the, the two games that I like the most, XCOM and um, Final Fantasy Tactics, because in Tactics it was, I guess it was the action points or the, the time that you needed to wait till your, it's your turn yeah, again. Yeah, charge time. Yeah, charge time, right, you're right. And um, in, in XCOM it's, um, I'm not quite sure if they called it endurance, but it means uh, you can't run around all the time at full speed and mm -hmm. expect to be perfectly fit when it comes to the next battle situation, you really need to um, somehow manage your, um, how to say this, uh, you need to take care of your, of your endurance. Uh, you can't just run around, you need to have some, some rounds where you just don't move that much or f for a certain reason, just stay where you are to, um, yeah, get uh, to breathe <laughs> and to, to gather uh, some energy again before you go on. Because this is what I liked Actually, I hated it in XCOM because I wanted to rush in and kill uh, kill the aliens. Mm -hmm. But from time to time, I realized, okay, my guys are so exhausted right now. I need to wait before I can rush into the next room. And um, I guess 
um, uh, one of the the major uh, points in games is not the the options that it gives you, but the limitations that it places on you. And these limitations, I'm very sure, are the things that keep you playing a game because they challenge you. If you can do anything in a game, if you make a game where you can do anything and there are no limits at all, it gets boring in a minute. Mm. But if there are limitations which are blocking you from, from acting as you want to, you always somehow want to uh, battle these limitations on your own and see how you can uh, make the best out of it. And that's why the third bar is endurance on our side. Um, and while you're, while you're fighting, you're running around for two, three rounds, and then you realize, okay, my guy who started moving with a move range of five fields now is down to a move range of two fields. I need to give him some time. He needs to rest around because, before I can use him again. Now that's, that's the third bar that we bring in there. Yeah. That is, an, that is an interesting setup, and I'm somewhat reminded of the, the relationship that movement had in Wild Arms XF regarding what abilities you could use. And a lot of the stronger abilities you couldn't use if you had already taken a move action. Uh, yeah, that's that's slightly different um, in our current status. You you can still move and act, mm -hmm. um, but your actions um, are also affected by your current status. So, for example, if you run around all the time and you're close to an enemy and you want to attack him and you have a very low endurance level because you are... Um, totally out of breath so you're, you're exhausted because you're running around all the time of course when you hit the enemy you can't hit him with all your power so the the damage that you do and the chance of hitting also goes down so this is something that you really keep in mind that's that's for for fighters just like it's for for mages as well if they are totally exhausted they can't focus on the spell and so the spell um on the one hand may not may not hit the enemy uh, and even if it does, it may not be as powerful. So it really comes into the calculations of, of hit chance and damage right now. Now, taking that taking that into uh, into account, um, since you meant you mentioned you mentioned resetting the you mentioned resetting the game because you didn't want to lose a a single, char a single character, um, or or as, or as some would call it save scumming. Um, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to characters running out of health in silence is a lie how 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 are you treating it is it is it a case where when they're when they're out you don't have that character anymore or can you still get them back yes uh there are um <clears throat> i need to to make a decision uh, a, a differentiation here because you have um some main characters uh which um could First of all, every character can permanently die. But based on the fact if he is a main character, um, this may lead to the fact that you really have um, game over. So especially if, if Kim, the, the main character, number one, is dying, then it's definitely game over. But some of the other main characters, um, uh, they can all die as well. But still the story would go on. It would take a slightly different path then. But it may really get tricky uh, within the next battles already if you if you lose some of your main characters. Of course, you can in the next city you can go to a tavern and recruit uh, someone uh, which will have approximate the level of uh, of your party, um, so it can seamlessly join in. Uh, but still, the main characters, of course, will be the ones that you focus on to um, to train them properly. And if you lose them. Um, yeah, it will get harder, and I, I guess that people will play it like this: that you will really um, try to keep all your main characters alive, while maybe at some point uh, sacrificing one of the the guys that you just recruited in the last city, mm -hmm. which, um, yeah, are somehow nameless uh, mercenaries that you just picked up along the way, and which which are somehow expendable. Yeah, in tech. Speaking of that, in tactics, there was there was the whole management of bra of bravery and faith, as I jo as I joked about at the top of the hour, which you had which you had to which you had to manage. Otherwise, you might end up lo you might end up um, losing party members. 
is are you planning on having anything like that or is that or is that not something that you've got that you're even considering uh not till now we have the the basic stats of course like uh hp mp we've got strength courage mm -hmm. intuition intelligence endurance and luck something like this and, and these values will go up but it's um not not like this uh example that you just mentioned from final fantasy tactics till now but i need to say this game is um under development and it's really by by the meaning of the word it's developing um there is no a complete plan already put on paper and I'm just following my own plan to coding it along. It's really developing while we go and we already made massive changes in this um, stats system uh, in the last months and uh, maybe we will realize at some point that we need to bring in another as aspect or we just want to bring in another aspect in this one and maybe something like this may come in. But right now there's nothing like this. Mm -hmm. Now with that with that in with that in mind there a lot of a lot of the a lot of the classes that you showed on the kickstarter page i can more or less i can more or less get the gist of i don't um it doesn't take a genius to figure out what a battle mage is going to do or what a gunner is going to going to do um or or for that or for that matter a pa or for that matter a paladin um but an illusionist that's one that ha that's one that has a whole lot of a whole lot of leeway. Um, what what would what would that particular class bring to the table? You're picking my my favorite guy in the game because I always like this kind of. Um, well, what is an illusionist? He's he's a skinny guy. He's a bit arrogant. He's a bit still a bit shy. He uh, has no muscles at all. He's no good at fighting at all. And he's a trickster. He uh, he can somehow use his his magic tricks um, to uh, to confuse you uh, and to um, to beat you that way. Mm -hmm. um, he will have very strange spells, very strange abilities. Because um, if he is a, in a direct one on one contact with a knight, he will lose the first round. Mm -hmm. So he needs to make sure he keeps his distance and he plays his tricks well. Um, but he's definitely one of the guys which will be, uh, I guess, the most interesting ones. The, will be the hardest one to train and to learn because you need to keep him alive uh, till he reaches a certain level, and this won't be easy. Um, but he will gain skills that nobody else can can gain and bring in uh, definitely some uh, some some great spells, some great abilities, and some fun elements as well into the game. I I really like this guy. Mm -hmm. And. Even even within the even within the more fam the more familiar um, archetypes, there's st there's still s there's still some room to th to throw spit to throw spins on things, and I when I when I looked around for some of the screenshots, I did notice that one that um, one of the characters was using the um, samurai class. Yeah, and. I'm cur I'm curious how I'm curious how that one would wor would work out as far as as far as what its san what its sandbox brings. Yeah, the the, the samurai <clears throat> definitely is a, is a very skilled uh, sword fighter. He may be able to use some kind of swords that nobody else can use, mm -hmm. and um, maybe to put him into contrast to the paladin. The paladin uh, also, of course, is is, is a, f a fighter in in shiny armor, but he. Uh, also can use some magic and the samurai won't be able to um, to use magic uh, he's really just this um, perfect sword fighter that uh, that you know he will also have some some special skills um, when it comes to to attacking with the sword so maybe even some some range attacks where he's jumping around something like this um, still again this is this is one class which we haven't totally worked out yet so um, we have already some stuff implemented but there are still there's still a lot of space for this guy to um to get more uh, abilities and uh, tricks that he can use mm -hmm. now one of the one of the one of the other one of the other screenshots i'd i saw seemed to have a engineer class uh which get which puts a fair few ideas in my head so i'm curious what what you have in mind with that one yeah, the engineer is um, 
uh, definitely some some. Um, it's, a, it's a technical guy. It's uh, I guess this is somehow putting myself into the game uh, mm -hmm. because I'm I'm a technical guy myself. I'm I'm a, I'm a coder. I'm a very uh, when it comes to programming, a very organized, very structured guy. Some kind of binary guy, you know, zero one. Mm -hmm. And this is how how I imagine the engineer. Um, also with some kind of um, ah, you, you know these guys which which work in their basement on strange stuffs to invent strange machines these guys always have a touch of insanity as well and this is how I imagine the engineer he will he will come up with strange uh, distance weapons definitely uh, maybe even stuff like frames flamethrower something like this so strange war machines that you could bring to the table mm -hmm. um, of course, this will will cause him to be rather slow. Not the best fighter. He's he's relying on uh, on the power of his machinery inventions um, that they will give him an advantage in the battle. Uh, we need to see if uh, if this turns out to be true. But uh, yeah, I like this guy because um, this guy as well allows us to bring in some uh, yeah some some crazy stuff, some strange stuff. Um, a, a lot of of classes. Um, are just there to especially a lot of stuff in the game is just there to open the 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 range of crazy ideas that we could put into it and still make sense so that's what i what i liked about the the game development in general in this case um because we are we are going here we're diving into a fantasy world um and this fantasy world even taking place in the in the mind of a little girl so it can be extra strange let's say mm -hmm. and that means on the other hand there are no real limitations because you can really go wherever your imagination is taking you um and i guess the engineer will be one of the guys who will come up with some strange weapons um maybe never seen before and uh, let's see uh, how they work because this is something that i'd like to bring in as well this is something from my um Tabletop Warhammer experience. I've played this quite a lot, and there I played the Skavens, the rats. Oh yes, <clears> and... the, the lovely yes. little ska the lovely little Skavens, whose biggest enemy is other Skaven. Yes, yes, they they were their own worst enemy, and they had these engineers as well, bringing strange war machines to the table. And if you roll the dice, you always had this twenty percent chance that the machine will just blow up and they all run away. Mm. And uh, this will somehow, I guess, we are somehow going this direction with with the engineer as well. Yeah, Skaven engineering. Th slap a few things together, add warp stone, and pr and pray to the great horned rat that it doesn't explode. If it does, yeah, well, exactly. it's that guy's fault. Yeah, exactly like this. Yeah. Or you could, or you could just say that it didn't. That it didn't. Ex it didn't explode by design. It's so somebody. So somebody sabotaged. <laughs> That may be with the Skavens, but uh, that was always hilarious when you're playing the Skavens. You 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 have this great uh, table where you put up your army, your Warhammer army, mm -hmm. and then it's your first turn. You fire the machine, you roll the dice, the machine explodes. Then you need to run this panic test for all the Skavens around. They all start running away. I, I actually lost one Warhammer battle in the very first round because the machine blew up. Every Skaven panicked. They all left the table because of panic, and that was it. it Building, setting up the entire game took half an hour, and then the game just took five minutes to play. That was <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> yeah, but that's uh, what you what you experience when you play this game, and that's that's yeah. the fun of it. I um, I w I was I was particularly evil because I had I had abused, um, I had I had run I had run Imperial Guard and I abused Creed, a f quite a few times. Okay. Um. Because of because of his whole tactical genius thing, where it, where and where um any unit any uh, units attached with him become scout units. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 somebody so somebody thinks that they have an avenue, and then all of a sudden they're all of a sudden they're dealing with um th three or four three or four full on armors. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Warhammer was, was really fun playing. It's been some time, and I uh, I don't have any longer my Skaven army, but that was really fun. Yeah. yeah, and that was of course with 40k with fantasy. I um, I think I I I think I had main I think I had mainly done dwarves because who because um who do, who doesn't like a good grudging? 
The dwarves were, were great. I, I, I'm, I, I guess I just choose the Skaven back then because all of the other races have already been taken by my friends and somehow the Skaven were the only one left. Mm -hmm. And um, But they were always fun to play and uh, I somehow liked these guys. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you lost hilariously or you won hilariously. There was nothing in between. It's, that's just the point. Well, my my, poli my policy was if it if there if there if there's space add guns if you have yeah. if you already have guns add more guns <laughs> yeah that's the draw of tactics yeah oh but with but with that in, with that in mind when it comes to when it, com when it comes to the when it comes to the when it comes to the class design overall um. I'm guessing that this is going to be a case where characters that gain experience are going to gain experience towards their overall level and towards their job on um, separate tracks. Uh, yes. <clears throat> um, basically, when, when you have um, chosen a job, so you, you um, set a character to a certain job class, then you will basically gain experience points in this job class. And this job training points that he gets there will allow him to learn skills in this job class. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have, I don't know, um, your uh, your white mage out there and you level him up 10 levels, then he's you just gain 10 levels as a white mage and has um, training points to spend on mm -hmm. white mage abilities. He can't transfer these points to, uh, to other classes. <clears throat> um, I like this concept as well because, again, this is some kind of limitation. You need to make decisions. You need to bring a newbie to the battlefield to level him up. Um, and this will always um, cause you some trouble and challenge you. But again, I guess um, you need this kind of challenges in a game because if it gets too easy, then it's, it's no fun at all. And especially it's no fun replaying it uh, because you always can easily flip between the classes. No, you really need to make decisions. At least um, half through the game, you need to decide um, where a character should develop. What should he become? Should he be an, uh, a, an, a great fighter? Should he be a great mage? Should, should he be an all-rounder doing everything but nothing really good? You need to make these decisions at some point. Um, and I guess this really um, makes it interesting because Two people playing the game will have totally different experiences because they will form their characters totally differently. And I also guess that the um, entire gameplay time, if you just follow the story, will not be enough to um, bring uh, to, to, to experience all classes to its end mm -hmm. and to all abilities which are there. So even if you play through the game, you may have seen only 50% of the possible job classes, abilities that you can gain. And um, this is something that I found very interesting in Final Fantasy Tactics as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you just need to restart and say, okay, this time I will try different jobs and see how they behave on the battlefield. But again, this gives the player um, options. And um, yeah, I like this idea because uh, it will be interesting to see how people will set up their characters. Um, that, on the other hand, is something which is quite hard to test because it's, it's almost impossible for us to test any possible combination and see how they behave. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess this is something which, at least in a, in a beta phase, will be very interesting to see how people which have not been part of the development choose to set up their characters uh, according to these job classes mm -hmm. um, because that's a problem. When you're developing something like this, you already know how to use it best and you always use it somehow the same way and bringing someone totally new to the table and placing him in front of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and it will be very interesting to see how, how these people will use the job classes. Yeah. Yeah. Now with that, with that in mind, with that in mind, when it comes, um, when it, there, a lot of, a lot of, ta a lot of tactics and the like had, had a bit of had a bit of a bad habit of um put of putting putting a putting a lot of emphasis on the casters this is and this is something that's not unique to to the, to those games because well even even the patient Z, even the patient zero in d and d has had this problem for the longest time um 
and when and when it comes to the more when it comes to the more martial um characters i'm get i'm guessing that they, i'm guessing that they're going to they're going to have their fair share of their fair share of abilities to you to utilize that that um so that they don't get outclassed if you'll pardon the pun so you mean that 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 uh, magical guys just have way more options to choose from than than the guy just uh, swinging his sword that's what you mean so to, that, to uh, a that... point yes yeah okay okay yeah definitely we we are really um trying hard to give any character the same range of abilities mm -hmm. which at some point really um forces us to be very creative but this is also fun uh, the fun part of the development mm -hmm. uh, because uh, i also would consider it very uh, quite boring if you have a knight and the only thing that he can do is swing his sword around and maybe dash the the, the enemies um that would be uh, not so interesting mm -hmm. um so there will uh, will be definitely a lot of abilities to be learned from uh, of course at some point it is harder to give a knight reasonable interesting abilities but um that's somehow part of the game and again why um, with this technique of um, mixing the abilities that you've learned as a mage with the abilities that you've learned as a knight um, a knight that you that has been a mage in his past and you take him as a knight to the to the next battle can choose from the from the stuff that he has learned in the past so you can uh, you can merge some of the job classes to um to unique characters that you have forged based on the path that you've chosen for them. Mm -hmm. So um, for, for some abilities, you just need to um, commit yourself to, okay, I make this guy now, for example, an illusionist because illusionists have this or this ability that I would like to have. This means this guy needs to come as an absolute noob to the battlefield if he gets one hit, he's dead. I need to protect him. I need to make care that he all still levels up because I want to have this ability. And uh, so some abilities will be um, common to everyone, but some of them will be just based in, in certain job classes. And if you want to get them, you need to learn them. And I guess um, this is definitely one of the most tricky parts in such a game, this, this, this kind of balancing that you make sure that every job class is... Um, worse the other job classes that, that there is not otherwise it's extremely boring everybody will pick the the best job class just level those up and move through the game uh, if as if there were no enemies um, it's definitely um, my responsibility to make the game to set up the game in that way that at a certain point in the game you need to have certain abilities certain jobs learned already mm -hmm. otherwise you can't go on and this is really this is part of, of the creative game development process, I guess. Yeah, uh, I will note one thing. That, one thing that I saw in one of your more one of your more recent videos that I find I find to be a very nice touch, and something I wish a lot of a lot, a lot more games that have turn based systems utilize is putting in a t is putting in a turn order thing at the top. Was that? Yeah. Uh, what was I'm guess I'm guessing put I'm guessing making sure that worked was a fair few lines of code. <laughs> it was it was a few lines of code, and here I need to be honest that was not my idea. Um, I I wasn't I didn't have this in mind, and I um, didn't felt it what was missing. But uh, my uh, coworker who is working with me full time on the game. Mm -hmm. Who is um, really bringing in uh, the the other fifty percent of coding, maybe even sometimes more because I have to do all the administration stuff and all this. But um, he came up with this one. He just uh, implemented it even without asking me. He just said, "I have this nice idea. I put it in, and I guess it really makes sense uh, because again, this one uh, you need this kind of information to really plan your tactic well and." Uh, it looks, uh, what you just said, it looks like a very simple gadget at the top that you see the turn order who's next. But when it comes down to coding, I guess to make it really work fluent as it is right now, we spent two full days, so two people working together eight hours, so making it about 30 hours, 32 hours, just to get this working as it is. Um, because there are a lot of things in it. Because a very, um, a unit which is very agile, which is very fast 
uh, of course can uh, can overtake someone in this turn order bar order bar mm. and you always need to position this right you need to handle the overlaying right and uh, yeah but that's uh, that's an interesting one that you bring it up because I, I need to be honest here that wasn't my idea and the major implementation wasn't done by me but by uh, by my coworker and um that's what i what i uh, consider very important as well when you're working as an indie game developer i know a lot of guys which are really completely working on their own which means you are caught up in your own head mm -hmm. and um it's so important to have someone from outside uh come along and say let's try this one because i would have never come up with this turn order bar uh, it, it wasn't missing for me. It wasn't necessary. But now that it's there and now that I see it, and I see it's, made, it's making perfect sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, what would you what would you say were some of the some of the some of the big learning experiences with with jumping with jumping in headlong into programming this this particular kind of game? The, the the major uh, learning outcome is definitely it takes way longer than I expected. And even after being a programmer for 20 years, and I know that programming takes a lot of time, um, this one's even taking way longer than, than I thought, um, especially on, on very small, very small changes. Um, sometimes uh, we start in the morning at, I don't know, nine, nine in the morning, and we just see a small thing in the game where we say this is not is not perfect right now. Then we spend eight hours working on it. To anybody outside, nobody would see a change at all. But we just know now it's perfectly coded, and it's future safe. And maybe by one pixel, it's better than it was before. And these things uh, keep you keep you very busy. They take way longer than I thought. Um, the the entire process um, of of setting up a team and how many people you need and how, how about how much stuff you need to think about uh, setting up such a game. As, as I said before, I I have chosen this type of game because I thought, okay, it's it's reasonable. The, the amount of work is handleable. Um, it's not that big. I was wrong there. It's very big. Um, and I have really learned uh, I need to do all this, um, all this balancing stuff. You need to, first of all, I have, I don't know, 10, 20 Excel sheets, sheets which just have all the information about the uh, the job classes, um, then about the abilities, then about all the stats, then the level up values, then a lot of tables where I just um, did calculations. If I have this kind of leveling up values, how would a unit behave if it's level 50, 60, 99, whatsoever? And then doing all these tests. Okay, if I have a knight of level 99 fighting against the knight, also level 99 how long will the fight take is this all reasonable <clears throat> then you need all this um of course all this uh, this this graphic stuff i underestimated this one uh the music stuff also very important you can have a wonderful game which is looking great if you don't have the right music i guess it, it will not it will not have the effect that it could have um and bringing all this together and also timing this somehow is is the biggest part of the of the entire development process, which I drastically underestimated. Because <clears throat> talking to the designers, um, first of all, finding the designers mm -hmm. took me at least half a year. Because you try around with different people. Uh, the problem here as well, this is this is a low budget project, so you try play around with people which are working on a low budget. Mm -hmm. And what you mostly get is the low-budget results. Um, so you need to uh, go on trying, trying, contacting people till you find someone who can work on a low budget and deliver quality that you uh, that you like to have. Mm -hmm. And even if you find these guys, um, you need to make sure that you somehow think the same way. Because uh, I'm no artist myself. I'm a programmer. I, I can program anything. That's not the problem. But I'm have no artistic skills at all. So I I can do 3D modeling and 3D texturing. Um, I'm capable of this. But again, there are artists out there which are way better than I am. But if you have an artist living, I've got artists, for example, living in, in South America, so in Colombia. Um, and they are not so good in English, for example. So, uh, and then you need to 
explain your your ideas about a character or a level or something like this. I translate it from German to English and mm -hmm. this guy will translate it from English into his language. And of course, a lot of information get lost. And if you don't find a person who is just thinking the same way than you do and is somehow already knowing where this is going, uh, it is almost impossible to invest the time that you would need to explain someone in a foreign language what you exactly want to have. So um, it, it took me quite a lot of time to find people whom I can write three or four lines, give them two example images, because I know they will, out of this poorly information given from my side, they will um, already come up with a result that I would like to have. And this really took a lot of time. It also costed a lot of money to get these people. And I'm very, very happy that I have them now because um, I can totally rely on the on the designers that I work with. Mm -hmm. I just write them a mail, write them a WhatsApp, giving them an idea, and they come back with um, with an image which perfectly hits um, the 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 uh, which perfectly is what I would wanted to have from them. And this is really very very important to find people that provide the style that you want to have. And this is something that I definitely um, underestimated. The programming as well, it, it all is it, taking so long and doing all the paperwork is so much. And it, it took us almost two weeks to set up the Kickstarter page because um, you're developing stuff. You had a lot, of, a lot of folders, a lot of files flying around on your hard disk. And then you are forced to bring this all into some kind of order mm. and to write some some texts. And uh, uh, that, uh, yeah, this just uh, takes time. But um Yeah, it, it, a lot of stuff I've learned, um, a lot of stuff I've underestimated. Still very optimistic to to uh, get the first version out by the mid of next year. Mm -hmm. But a lot of learnings, and this is what I like about it. If um, if you do something, if you do a project, any kind of project, and you already know everything about it, it's quite boring. And I can say I learn every day something new, and that makes it extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... To be to be fair, I've I've made I've made programming I've made programming jokes about how about how um a, about how when someone when someone sets up a code that does that doesn't have any errors the pro the programmer goes I have no idea how this worked and when it do, and when it does have errors he goes I have no idea how this worked yeah oh. and that's uh, happening every day almost you're watching <clears throat> you're, you're looking at a piece of code that you have written uh, obviously you have written a few months ago and, and i look at the code and i just ask myself did i wrote this mm -hmm. and why did i wrote it and how the fuck is this working but why is this working why does it need to be here mm -hmm. that's so hard it's in total it's it's about 100 30, 140 Java classes, so files, 100, 140 files in total, just the programming files, mm -hmm. and um, a total of about 200,000 lines of code. And from time to time, you, you just see some code and you have no clue what it's doing, no clue why it's necessary. And then you just spend one or two hours playing around with it to get an idea what it's doing, and then hopefully probably commenting it. But that's That's part of the programming business. Um, there's what you just said. When I wrote this code, uh, uh, only God knew what it's doing. Now only God knows what it's doing, and that's yeah. you feel this every day. As much as as much as I have joked, as much as I have joked about it, as, as over over the sh over the course of this show, there's always the programmer's drinking song. <laughs> the programmer's drinking song. I, I, maybe I didn't even know it. 99 little bugs in the code. 99. Oh, okay, okay, code. okay, okay, okay. Now I got it. Yes. Down, you patch it around. 108 little bugs in the code. <laughs> yes, yes. It's exactly like this. Yeah. But with that said, as, as somebody who as somebody who subscribes to a lot of Mets, a lot of Matsuno's work, I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how Silence is a Lie de develops over time. Especially, especially given the. It seems that you're wearing a multitude of hats throughout this project. Uh, yes, uh, I do. And um, I'm also aware that this may be a problem um, because I need to wear hats, uh, which I never planned to wear and which I'm definitely the, not the best person for. Mm -hmm. But um, that's, I guess, the challenge 
uh, of every indie game developer, you simply can't afford to pay all the people that you need. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also, ah, as a programmer, you're always some kind of control freak. And uh, sometimes you want to keep control on things, even if you know that you are not the best person to do it. Um, but on the other hand, this is also part of, of such a project. Um, I can, in this project, I can do whatever I want to do. And this is a, a great amount of freedom mm -hmm. uh, that many programmers would like to have in their everyday job. I've, I've worked as a programmer for 20 years for my clients. And in this everyday job for clients, you can't do whatever you want to do. And in this project, I can. When I have a crazy idea, I just can bring it in. Um, even if people later complain, okay, that's, but if, if you do a project on your own like this and you put so much effort and so much heart and so much money into it, you want to do it like you want to have it. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's not some kind of uh, ego trip, but it's um, if I do it differently, then I would like to have it and it fails later. Then I will always ask myself, okay, what would have happened if I would have done it? as I would like to have it. And um, I just want to avoid the situation where I put out a game, <clears throat> um, which uh, by um, maybe which uh, which may uh, meet people expectations, but it's not the game that I wanted to do. That would be that would be not the way I would like to have it. I will make a game how I would like to have it. I will put in everything that I enjoy. And if I find people who also enjoy it, that's great. That's wonderful. But if not, that's also fine for me because then I've done a game like I would to have it. Yeah. And I guess um, as an indie game developer, or I guess this is a big advantage of indie game developers. They are making games from the heart. Mm -hmm. um, and you can often see this in indie games. Uh, if you compare to AAA titles where you know that business decisions have been made to make the game like this, and um, you can really feel this in games. And uh, yeah, that's, I guess this really makes a difference. Yeah. Um, like I said, I'll be looking, I'll be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come up, to come all the way over to the temple, braving the hell of time zones to enjoy the madness. You're welcome. And, Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> That's great, yeah. And I would love to, uh, as soon as I have some, some release date uh, ahead, it would be great just to, to talk a bit once more and maybe even to see how it has developed uh, till then because even I may, may get surprised by where this is going because, as I said, nothing is planned out completely this game is really developing as we go and um, yeah maybe uh, maybe interesting to talk about once more yeah and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet but until then on behalf of the good brothers present and not present my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>